Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our second webinar with Viking Bolt. Today we have also a very interesting topic. Uh, it's going to be about malting process, and our specialist uh, brewmaster Raimo Kolyonen from Finland will tell you more and more about uh, malting process why it's so important and what do you need to know about that. Uh, before we start, I will just tell you some technical details. So our uh, webinar will last around one hour. We have, pre we have uh, prepared the presentation, which will take around 25, 30 minutes. And after that, we will start the question and answer session so if you will have any questions, please write them in the chat window. The chat window you will find on the uh, right panel, on the right uh, lower uh, side of the window. And please type all the questions so we will try to answer them. If we will run out of the time and there, there still will be questions, not answers during the webinar, we will send you our answers on your email. So don't worry, you will get everything what you will need from us. I would like to say also thank you for all your feedback from the first webinar, which we ran last week. We got some very nice feedback from you. We got very positive feedback as well. So we will try to do our best to satisfy you also with this event. So let's start, Raimo, the presentation is yours. Okay, hello everybody. And uh, I saw the list and it's always, I'm happy to see that malting as process, there are people interested in that all over the world. So let's see about malting process. So we will look more deeply today on steeping, then the germination and kilning processes, which are the actual malting processes. But before we jump in uh, shortly, here you can see uh, a process picture. It's about our Viking Malt Lahti Malt House. The whole process is, is, is uh, in this picture. Uh, but we will concentrate on this gray oval area. Uh, I have one slide, what's happening before that, and it's a little bit relating what we discussed a week earlier about we take the raw material, what kind of raw material we are going to use. <clears throat> so what is done? before the actual malting process starts, is that we will have uh, our raw material and we will take an intake pre-analysis. We will check the quality uh, of the raw material. What are we going to use? Uh, it's found to be okay. We know the protein level, we know the variety, etc. We know it will germinate. Then we take the actual lot in. We take a new sample and we check it once more. We want to be sure that the variety is okay. It will germinate. We know the protein level. Then we do, uh, you can see in a picture, this condition area, we will do the screening and there are three years half corn sorters. We will make the raw material as good as possible to fit in malting use. And then after conditioning, it will go to this grain storage silos where it is uh, one variety in one silo, uh, maybe even uh, put a higher protein levels in one other silo and lower protein level in another silo. That's, that's uh, if you want to really play with the quality. Uh, then starts the actual uh, malting process. So the production manager uh, has discussed with the sales and you, you have a clear view. What are you going to do? I'm going to pick up a certain variety with certain protein level and start to do the process. And uh, about steeping, germination, and kilning, this is actually a question what, what we get quite often that what is put 
into a process? Do we use use um, many kinds of chemicals or or that kind of substances? No, you can see in steeping it's only water and air, and out goes light corns and CO2. And in during germination phase, uh, cool humid air is put in, and out goes some heat and CO2 again. And in the kilning phase, hot, dry air is put in and uh, warm, humid air is going out. So it looks like pretty much the green label uh, product. <clears throat> so then the, actual, the steeping process starts. Uh, typical timeline for steeping is uh, today about 24 hours. You don't need, need uh, uh, more times. So of course, you may have some specialties, but the, the uh, main products are made with 25-hour uh, uh, steeping times. And there is uh, two phases of steeping, uh, wet steeping and dry steeping, or you may call it aerist uh, period. So uh, in wet steeping, you can see a picture in the middle. There are kernels immersed in a water and there is a periodically compressed air is blown into the water. The target is to give oxygen into, into this water. So in the middle picture, there's an aeration going on. And in upper picture, you can see uh, aeration rings. So from this kind of rings, uh, the compressed air is pressed into the water. And during the dry steeping, uh, uh, the air, uh, water is drained off and the grain bed just lies there uh, uh, quite wet and getting uh, moisture inside the kernel. Uh, it looks like, like nothing is happening, but we have continuous uh, remove of CO2. So air is sucked through the uh, kernel bed. And by that way, we take CO2 out because it would prevent the barley to start the uh, germ getting ready for germination. But one other key factor is that we can control uh, the temperature. Uh, without this uh, CO2 removal and this air flow through the bed, the um, temperature would ri raise quite quickly. So after uh, the steeping, steeping um, the targets are quite naturally moistening of kernels to be able to germinate. So uh, we had the demand that the uh, barley, what we did take into a process was maximum 14.5% of moisture. So it was quite quite, quite stable and, uh, and was good to um, keep in a silo. But we want to moisten the kernels uh, that it starts to germinate. You can read from some books that 32-33% is enough, but it's, it's not enough for malt houses because uh, we want it to start germinating rapidly and all kernels at the same time. So we aim up at uh, 14 plus uh, moisture percents. Uh, other target is that we wash the kernels. We take a dust away. Of course, during our process, we have a, taking a lot of dust and broken kernels and whatsoever away. But there is always some dust that you can take take away. Uh, we remove floaters. That those are the light particles that get stayed on top of the water during uh, wet steeping. And uh, one key factor also is that when we do the aeration. Uh, uh, the kernels, they rub against each to each other. And by that way, it intensifies the washing effect. And we, got, we get uh, as clean uh, material to a germination as possible. Uh, the idea is that uh, it is very homogenic uptake and distribution of moisture into the kernel. It's very critical to a quality. And what is written be uh, below that, it's an important part part of malting process. We mainly have uh, during germination from four 
to maybe seven days time to germinate. So if you if we lose one day, it's a huge percentage. It's not the same as you put the barley in a field and it has some months there to grow. So it, it's not that critical if one is starting a day earlier than the other. But during malting process, it's a must that everything starts at the same time. So how we monitor uh, this uh, moisture, what we got into the kernels, uh, we call it degree of steeping and it, it expressed uh, as a percentage. Uh, it's mainly that we have a, this kind of a infrared systems, halogen analyzers, you may have a EBC oven or what, that kind of a system that you uh, measure a weight then you put it in an oven or in this kind of system, you heat it up, you take a moisture out and then you, you know, wet it again and then you can calculate the, the percentage of, of water what was inside it. Pretty simple system, but uh, it's a must how you can follow up. And during also the steeping, we uh, had a clear view uh, if we are doing a pilsner malt or if we are aiming at the darker malt, uh, we play with the moistures, what we want to be uh, as a steep of most. After steeping uh, comes the germination. And uh, I must say that a uh, malting plant is an enzyme factory. Uh, we have two goals uh, during uh, germination is to produce enough enzymes. Many kinds of, of enzymes we come that in a, uh, a later phase. And uh, then the other other key factor is that we anyway try to limit the growth that uh, there is not an excess uh, malting losses. So two goals, to grow it as strongly as possible, but that it needs to go the way we want. So some limitation is, is needed uh, at the same time. <clears throat> Enzymes was mentioned and uh, here are numbers from one to eight. It's not uh, just to show, show the different ones. So there will be uh, during germination alpha amylase. It is synthesized during the germination. So if you can measure uh, alpha amylase from a, a raw barley, there has uh, a lot of raw barley. There has been some kind of pre-germination uh, in the field. Uh, alpha amylase is produced during uh, germination. Beta amylase is already in a, in a barley, but it's in a binded form, and it will be much more effective af after uh, malting, and uh, it is released during malting. Limit texturinase, uh, same as uh, alpha amylase, it is synthesized during uh, the germination. Then comes a bunch of, uh, of uh, enzymes like beta-glucanase, xylanases, proteases, lipases, and lipoxygenases. They are already in uh, barley, but when we get the moisture in, uh, they will be activated and uh, with certain temperatures and right moistures, uh, they can work, work with the grain so that we get the malt like we want. Typically, the only of these, what we measure is alpha amylase and beta amylase. They are analyzed uh, as a laboratory. You may get, uh, Brewer may get an uh, uh, analysis result of those. But the other ones, uh, like beta glucanase, uh, and we, we measure beta glucan level of the malt. So we can kind of see what has the beta glucanase enzyme done or proteases we can see what is the soluble nitrogen level, or what are the fan levels, or et cetera, et cetera. So we monitor the germination that uh, moisture, it needs to be what we want. Uh, temperature of the kernels, what are the conditions during the germination, and time, typically from four to seven days, 
depending of the variety, depending of, of the target, what we are doing. Some pictures of germination equipment. So there is a one rectangular germination box. They can be uh, in many different sizes. There can uh, bed, uh, deep, deep of the bed is uh, from roughly one meter. It can be 1.5 to 1.8 meter even. Uh, in the other picture, you can see a spray nozzles that uh, they are typically and they, they are used to change the moisture levels to, during the germination. Of course, there are round uh, germination boxes also, also used, and the, the batch sizes of those may be really, really huge. This is uh, uh, one of the best pictures I have seen to show what, what is happening uh, during the germination. This picture is taken by the Technical Research Center of Finland, and uh, uh, I've used this uh, in quite many, many lectures. Uh, so you can see uh, how the inside of the kernel is. There are the uh, blue structures, they are the cell wall structures, uh, then you can see the uh, dark black black areas, uh, that's a starch, which is mainly inside of these uh, cell walls. And then you can see the proteins there. There is in the upper upper layer of, of the kernel, there is a lot of protein, it's called aleuron layer, but also there are some proteins uh, uh, inside the, the uh, um, starch and uh, matrix. This is how, how, how it looks before we start malting. And, uh, now I have also uh, the next uh, uh, picture just to show uh, this is uh, uh, that's, it's really rich structures, quite similar what we use when we do the constructions for, of different different things that you, you have a similar kind of structure also inside the barley kernel. That's why if you are not careful enough, you bite a ker uh, barley kernel not malted, uh, you may lose easily a teeth. It's very, very hard. After malting, uh, the barley kernel looks like this. So almost all the cell wall structures are gone. Gone. Uh, beta glucanases, xylanases, they have done their work. Proteases have done their work. Also, the proteins are more or less available throughout the kernels. And now we will have also the uh, Amylase, uh, amylases, alpha amylases, uh, also done in, in here and so on. So on. this is ready mode. You may now wonder why there's a little of this cell wall structures left there. That's because we want it to be. Actually, it's in many brew houses uh, a specific case. Uh, there's said that the maximum beta glucanase level is somewhere maximum 200, this is something like that. And it's done because we could grow the kernel more also to get this uh, blue area away, but then we will have a less extract. So this is actually the best possible combination uh, to operate and get good yields. This is the target. This is what's happening uh, during a germination. Then comes the uh, kilning. And the uh, main reason uh, for kilning is that we stop the biochemical uh, and biological processes. During the first hours in a kilning, the germination actually is still going on actively, but gradually when the moisture is going down and less and less, uh, all these uh, uh, processes stop and then, then we just keep on drying it. And uh, why it's done, uh, we get the storage stability. Typically, malt is dried to a water content of 3 to 7%. Uh, it's quite handy. It's very stable. You can store it in, in a silo up to two years, then uh, maybe even longer if the conditions are good. Um, 
of course, brew houses don't want to buy water from malt house. They want to buy uh, a source of starch and, and enzymes. Uh, we do also a color formation during kilning and a flavor, flavor formation. Uh, we also remove some un undesir undesirable flavors. Uh, one example is this uh, DMSP, which is a, a precursor for DMS. And uh, typically, brewers don't want it to stay in the world. So there's the, uh, a limit value where, where we hit. We give heat to the uh, malt during kilning, and we can, we can get rid of uh, of this uh, DMSP. It will give some off flavor to a beer, uh, like cooked vegetables or so. Uh, one reason also that when we do the drying, we can more easily get the re uh, rootlets off. Rootlets give gives a bitter taste uh, into a, a, a beer and, and into a, a wort. So it's quite valuable or we take it take it off and it is used uh, in a in a feed pellet or, or so it depends on the malt house where they're using but it's it's going to in some other use than than for malts because uh, it's it is uh, good for for example animal animals uh, talking about a little bit this kilning uh, there are roughly four different sections during kilning. And this is an example from a Pilsner malt process. So we go in a free drying. Uh, the temperatures may be something up to 60 degrees of Celsius. And we go easily from when we start, it's 40 plus something percent. We can come quite easily and quickly down to a moisture level of roughly 20%. Uh, then it starts to get really slow, so we need to go to this forced drying phase. We increase the temperatures to 60 to 75 degrees Celsius, and moisture goes down to 10 to 12 percent level, and then starts the curing temperatures. Uh, they are somewhere 80 to 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, there are demands with uh, some brewery groups that you need to use certain 80 plus temperatures for for uh, per, uh, two hours or so depends of the of the companies. But that this is only one reason also that we go in, in uh, high temperatures like this. It will drop the moisture down to three to five, which is quite typical for Pilsner malt. And of course, if we are doing some other malts for example, like Muni malt or something, uh, we are doing some tricks uh, during these uh, phases one and phases two. There may be uh, uh, some air rotation and air circulation in different ways. We play with the fans and we don't try and uh, target is not to, to dry up the product uh, as quick as possible. Uh, we do we do some, uh, some uh, stewing effects or that kind of to create uh, very multi flavors, maybe even a red color or, or things like that. But nevertheless, are we doing a, a Pilsner malt or are we doing some kind of a, a kiln special malts? It all the time ends up with cooling. So we don't want to send malt batch that the temperature is 80 plus degrees Celsius to a, to a silo because it's, it's, it's never going to cool there. We need to actively cool uh, the bats down, and then it will go go to a decalming, and then to a malt silo. <clears throat> then are the special malts. Of course, uh, we do in our process the uh, first the selection of the raw material. It might be barley, it may be oats, wheat, or rye. Of course, this tells a lot already what's going to happen there. But then, with every variety with every special malts. There are specially selected steeping conditions. There are German, different germination condi conditions, uh, different temperatures, 
uh, times, the moisture, etc., etc., and then of course the kilning con conditions. Uh, there are many kinds of different uh, programs what we use. Maybe sometimes that uh, even we use uh, uh, tuned uh, programs with Pilsner malt depending of uh, what kind of variety we use. Some take more easily uh, color, some release more easily uh, soluble nitrogen, etc., etc. And then uh, one chooses also the, uh, of course, if we will make a, a caramel malt uh, and it's made in this uh, kind of a roastery, you need a green malt in it. But of course, caramel malts can also be, be made in a special kilns. Uh, for example, the ones what kind of we have uh, at Lahti, Lahti uh, malt house. We can do uh, uh, caramel malts uh, there easily, up to roughly 300 uh, EBC color levels. Um, then are the products that are made from ready Pilsner malt. So we firstly made the Pilsner malt ready, but then take the ready Pilsner malt, put it in a roastery, and we can make uh, these cookie malts. Uh, we can make ch chocolate light malts, uh, chocolate dark. We can do uh, also uh, a black malt. Those all are made from uh, already ready made Pilsner malt. All right, that was uh, shortly about the, the malting process, uh, what's happening, and uh, and uh, hope you got something out of it. Uh, so steeping, maybe one day, uh, germination up to seven days, and then kilning for one day more. So we are easily nine nine days, and then you take a, take a analysis and then it's it's 10 days done so so that's about uh malting thank you thank you very much raimo that was a very nice and very interesting presentation uh, we of course have some questions to you but before we will start questioning you i will answer one technical question will these webinars be posted online somewhere yes of course you have a couple of uh, possibilities to get back to our webinars and our recordings because um, shortly after our webinar is finished you will receive a thank you email for attending the webinar and in the email you will have a link to the recorded webinar you will have also the pdf file with this presentation so you can study it on your own at in your and in your pace uh, and the second option to get to the recorded webinar is to check out on our website in the viking world uh, in the library you will find all the presentations what we've done till now and of course we will publish the newest one we will which we will serve within the next few weeks so i hope you will uh, share it with your teammates, with your colleagues, so you can uh, get back later to the material which we done right now. And Raimo, there is a question to you. Is there specific water treatment necessary for steeping? Um, the water is typically, uh, for example, what we use, uh, use at the uh, Lahti, it's a uh, it's uh, inside the demands of of uh, of uh, of a good quality, uh, how you say, almost like a household household water. But um, today it's getting more and more uh, that uh, malt houses uh, start to make uh, water water. Uh, circulation so you you need to have a, some kind of a cleaning system uh, for for the water so you you can't have any any bad micro mo, microbes inside inside the water like a coliforms or that kind of uh, of of microbes that that will later give a give a harm uh, to a, to a consumers so that way i think the water needs to be needs to be uh, uh, clean 
Okay, uh, Raimo, there is another question and I will just in a moment show up the slide what we are talking about. Do the numbers during the enzymes and germination slide indicate what days the enzymes are activated and what does the color red and gray showcase? So I think that was the slide number 11, what we are talking about, and this is it. Yeah, yeah, the colors are, they are not indicating here anything. They are just uh, just uh, the picked up. So the numbers, just the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, uh, just to, to put them uh, in, a, in a different, different categories. But uh, typically, uh, we start to get alpha amylase. Alpha amylase is ac active after uh, two, three, three days of uh, of germination, and and it will also continue continue towards the end. Uh, beta amylase level, uh, they will raise up and they will be released. And uh, typically, if we want to get a really really high beta amylase level, uh, we we do the germination up to seven seven days but there is also related of, of the uh, temperatures that uh, typically if you want the high enzyme enzyme levels and you you use a uh, uh, long germination time you need to drop drop quite quite much uh, of, of uh, temperatures and by that way you can you can get high high figures uh, beta beta glucanase uh, they start to operate quite quickly uh, after after the germination nation starts, but uh, you can notice if you go in too low low uh, moisture levels or even with too low um, germination temperatures that the beta beta glucan what we actually then measure will stay higher. So high moisture higher temperatures, uh, they are keywords if you want to go quite low in beta glucans. Of course, this affects to other other uh, analysis too. So we, we need to always see the picture full. There is a spectrum of, of uh, different analysis what to do. <clears throat> Good, great. So we have another question. Uh, what are uh, why are enzymes more heat stable when in the presence of lower moisture? Ah, uh, yeah, that's that's a, a key key question uh, when we do the typical of a kilning process for for uh, Pilsner malt. Like you can see, there is plenty of uh, active amylases left, and we use even up to eighty five degrees Celsius when when. Uh, the kernel is quite dry. Uh, the heat doesn't that uh, actively uh, conduct inside uh, into a kernel. Uh, if you go in too high temperatures uh, too quickly during kilning, you get easily a lot of color, but you also destroy uh, your your enzymes. Easily both are both are gone, alphas and betas. Next question. Do you use carbon dioxide in order to slow down the germination process? And how often do you look at the acrospire counts to make process decisions during germination? Yeah, uh, we can we can sometimes it's it's not typical because uh, we have a, a good quality control when we take the uh, product uh, raw material in, so we know that it will start start to uh, grow at the same times. But if you 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 know you may have sometimes uh, uh, some some issues like a very unexpected dormancy in some some batch it doesn't go. You may do that. You do the steeping, and 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 you start to play during steeping that you maybe a little bit less air rate so the active one uh, start quite quickly to to germinate but if you use some uh, some uh, less uh, co2 removal or a little bit less uh, aeration uh, 
uh, they will slow down and then the late ones have a little bit more time to pick up the moisture and maybe wake up. But this is uh, something that it's not done uh, typically. But about the uh, uh, acrospay or rootlet counts, we calculate these typically after one day of germination and after three days of germination. Uh, this is quite good. You can check it, what's happening during the first day. Uh, you should have a, a good numbers there. If not, you have some time to, to react. And after three days, you can check out, uh, did your reaction save the situation? If not, you have still a day or several days time to take it separately some other silo, or maybe you can prolong the germination time to get the quality what you want. Thank you very much. Next question is about smoked malt. How is smoked malt produced? Can you share pictures? Well, I have not here now the, the pictures, but typically how we do smoked malt, we have ready-made Pilsner malt also, and we have a, a special smoke generator, and uh, it's it's a, a kind of a roasting drum kind of system that, uh, that uh, the malts, which are a little bit moistured afterwards we we increase the moisture inside the malt and then then it rotates inside inside the smoke for certain certain hours and and uh, then it's taking out and that's the way we do smoked malt but there are uh, for example the malt houses that do these heavily peated malts malts for whiskey production they may do the whole whole uh, kilning that uh, they are burning peat peat and uh, and the smoke from the from the burnt peat is going going con continuously through the malt bed and you get huge amount of of uh, smoked and peated smoke flavors nice to know that what is the relationship between the Kolbach number and malt modification um typically uh uh, the higher the modification level is, the higher the Kolbach number is. But of course, a Kolbach, Kolbach is calculated value, so you have a, a um, total nitrogen, soluble nitrogen level, uh, uh, it's divided by the uh, protein levels, and, and then you, you have a certain multiplier number. So it's calculative value, but uh, uh, so, Kolbach level is uh, sometimes not that accurate because there is uh, two different different analyses and and uh, both analyses have their tolerances so so it may sometimes go go a little bit wrong but the higher the modification is the higher is the Kolbach index that's typical okay Sometimes we got a Pilsner malt with a reduced pH level in much low is much lower than other batches. Why it happens? What in the malting process affects on that? Hmm. It shouldn't move too much. I uh, some years back made made a big survey about uh, our uh, pH level, and it was roughly roughly. Uh, six with uh, 5.95 maybe plus minus 0, 0.05 so quite all were inside that but of course uh, you may have a lower pH level if there has been some issues uh, during uh, germination maybe you have uh, some hours that your uh, fan on, uh, which is blowing air through the germination bed has gone broken. Uh, the, all the oxygen is used and some lactic acid bacteria may start to grow and increase a little bit uh, of this acid acidity and the, that makes that your pH level goes down. Typically, uh, there may have been some issue with technical uh, equipments if this happens. Okay, great. So, how do you control the amount of broken kernels and dust in the malt being shipped? Um, 
there is a just before uh, putting the mall. So I'm sorry, but I see that I think we have lost the connection with Raimo. And actually, I don't know what's happened. If you will not reconnect with Raimo in a moment, we will need to finish our event right now. And still, I see more questions on our list. So definitely, we would like to answer all of them but we will send you the answers on the email raimo Ladies and gentlemen, we have some technical issue right now and we have lost the connection with Raimo. Uh, please give us two or three minutes more and we will try to regain connection with Raimo. I think he's already inside the presentation and maybe he will join us in a moment. Raimo, can you? All right, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear uh, you right now. Uh, sorry, okay. for some reason I was dropped out. Okay, so um, maybe we will try to get back to our questions. So let's try to answer that what's on the screen right now. Yeah. How do you control the amount of broken kernels and dust in the mold being shipped? Oh, typically, there is a, a, a kind of a, a screening system and also uh, uh, in the same one, airflow through the bed that we, we suck all the dust and, and, and that way. It is just before uh we put the malt inside a, a wagon railway wagon or vessel or it will go to the uh in a bucket form like 25 kilo bags or or, or big bags so there is a, a, a equipment that screens the small ones broken ones uh, out and also sucks the dust off we typically at Lahti, we lose roughly 1.5 percent of the product during that phase. So we, we try to do, do this seriously. So we take a lot of material away so that the product would be good. Good, great. Raima, I see some more questions to you. So for HTP specification of special mold, you count only beta amylase or alpha amylase and limit dextronize partly as well. Uh, no, uh, limit dextrinase is, is not uh, an, analyzed uh, ge in generally. Uh, um, we concentrate on that if we start to have some uh, some fermentation problems or or the attenuation figure starts to go down. So then we need to see that is there some 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 problem with this uh, limit dextrinase value. But typically, uh, alphas and betas are, are analyzed. Okay, and I think we have the last question for now. Uh, 
do you have experience with malt from one silo, but strong differences during process? For example, at laboratory test Congress method, there is a transparent sample, but next time opalescent sample plus filtration times are totally different. Uh, it it may happen, of course, sometimes. That's one one of the key things that we look uh, during during the development of different barley varieties. So this if this kind of problem starts to occur with some variety, uh, it it will be dropped out during during the uh, developing phase. But uh, it quite generally. Uh, also reflect that you might have some kind of uh, a problem problem uh, during during a malting malting process if if this happens. Uh, the opalescent uh, word sometimes it is uh, if you do and you get some kind of uh, uh, opal uh, word if you add even a small percentage of some other. Uh, barley variety as malted, it's gone. So as all the Pilsner products, what we send to breweries, they are always a collection of, of, or a blend of two or three different varieties. This is a must. I think it's in many main uh, breweries, Pilsner malt specification that there needs to be at least two or three different varieties. So by that way, this uh, Opal word doesn't actually exist because of this blend. Okay, Raimo, I think we have uh, answered all the questions and I don't see that anybody's typing anything right now in the chat window. So it's time to say thank you for attending today's webinar. I hope you joined that, what you heard that from us. And I would like to invite all of you to our next webinar next week, where we are going to talk about how to use Viking molds. There will be really a lot of good knowledge and very many tips and tricks about our portfolio, about our products. So please join us next week at the webinar. Thank you for attending. See you next week. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.